than 350 years ago, William Shakespeare wrote, Come like shadows, so depart. Today in Vietnam, American combat soldiers are heeding these words as they probe for and pursue a shadowy enemy. In Vietnam, the enemy is called Charlie. He may be any place and anyone, man, woman, or child. For neither the North Vietnamese regular army nor the sinister Viet Cong fights according to what might be called the rules of modern warfare. Bold, tough, and crafty, theirs is the strategy of the guerrilla, to avoid open conflict and fight from ambush, or to infiltrate civilian populations and spread confusion and terror by murder, mine, or booby trap. The only effective way to counter these guerrilla tactics is to beat Charlie to his punch. Seek out and pursue him before he can put his plans into operation. Thus in Vietnam, when intelligence sources indicate that the enemy is preparing a buildup, our forces move swiftly to catch the Viet Cong off guard and frustrate their plans. This is done by means of a strike operation. Strike operations are swift moving offensive actions in which the guerrilla rather than terrain is the target. Because guerrilla forces are constantly moving and shifting, planning for a strike operation must be flexible from the top down to the squad. Each man involved must be well briefed on the job he is to do and prepared to adjust quickly to changing battle conditions. The briefing sessions sound like this. And tomorrow morning, 0700, we are scheduled to depart on Operation Oshkosh. We'll go into an area in battalion strength. B Company leading, C Company, and then A Company. We'll go to choppers, 0730. Loading procedures are the same as usual. The enemy situation is company strength. Their known weapons in this area are small arms and booby traps. Our mission is to sweep an area of approximately 6,000 meters. B Company will be on our right flank. It will set up in a blocking position. We'll carry water and rations for two days. Chain of command is the same as usual. Frequencies and call signs for the companies is the same. There's not any questions. Let's move out. Early the next morning, the strike force prepares to move out. Once committed, it gets underway with a minimum of delay and a maximum of secrecy. Waiting to board the choppers provides a welcome break from the tension which has been mounting since the strike operation was first announced. Liftoff time approaches. The helicopters, which will carry the strike force to the enemy, are fueled, warmed up, and boarded with a quiet efficiency that says more clearly than words, these men are pros. Then they are airborne. Vietnam has been called a helicopter war, and to a great extent, this is true. Choppers are used for troop movement, supply, medical evacuation, just about everything, including fire support. Up ahead, an armed helicopter blasts the areas around the landing zone, or LZ, with rockets. Bitter experience is taught that what looks like the best LZ may be well surrounded by Viet Cong defense positions. 
so the selected landing sites must be carefully scouted and softened up before landings are attempted, since helicopters are most vulnerable when landing or taking off. As the choppers approach their destination, tension mounts. Even the newest recruit can see what inviting targets they make for VC automatic weapons fire. Each man aboard recalls the lessons learned during long hours of training for this moment. When the chopper touches down, move out fast. Secure the area immediately. Have your weapons loaded and ready to engage the enemy at all times. There is a slight bump and the men are on the ground, running for cover. When the first wave has landed and secured the area, artillery and support elements are brought in and set up. Then the command is move out. The search for Charlie is on. To neutralize the enemy and destroy his base of operation, his weapons, and his sources of supply. Only in this way can he be rendered powerless to wage war. Toward this end, today's soldier, despite his modern weapons and the support of planes and artillery, battles the Viet Cong in much the same unorthodox way that Rogers' Rangers fought in the French and Indian War. For example, in cross-country operations, he has learned to avoid Charlie's ambushes and booby traps, and has himself become an expert at laying an ambush. When he must take a road or trail, the modern GI has learned to keep a careful eye out for snipers, ambushes, or mines. On patrol, he keeps a protective interval between himself and his mates. The new soldier has relearned the importance of guards in protecting his patrol against the sudden surprise of sniper or ambush. and he's come to realize that security must be kept out when crossing a stream or ravine. The far bank must be free and clear of the enemy before the main body crosses by assault boat or by fording if no other means are available. Today's combat man has also become booby trap conscious, aware of the areas in which the VC plant feeds devices and alert to seek them out so that they may be destroyed in place to protect the men who follow him. The modern soldier has discovered that in jungle warfare, nature can be as dangerous as the VC. Heat exhaustion, insects, or contaminated food or water can put him out of action as surely as a sniper's bullet. So he's learned to counter these enemies by using the precautions, medicines, and chemicals which are effective against them. Last but not least, today's GI has learned through hard and often bitter experience that no two patrols are alike, except that all such missions are uncomfortable and lonely. Often, for what will seem like hours on end, 
Nothing is heard but the cracking of branches or the swishing of leaves as the patrol moves quietly ahead. Nothing, that is, but the ever-present sounds of the jungle. In Vietnam, operations larger than platoon size usually force the enemy into hiding. It's the small unit moving quietly like this that has the best chance of catching the VC unawares. This is how to beat the gorilla at his own game. But to do it, you've got to stay alert, for most combat occurs suddenly and at extremely close range. Suddenly, as it began, the ambush is overcome. The patrol scouts the area carefully and completely, but Charlie has disappeared, fled back into the shadows, leaving his dead and wounded behind. Guards are posted to warn against his reappearance. Not until then can the men relax their guard enough even to bind up their wounds. While careful watch is kept for any sign of Charlie's return, first aid is given to the wounded. Those with minor injuries like this, as well as those with more serious wounds. Casualties for whom first aid is not enough will be airlifted back to the base hospital for further treatment and recuperation. The others return to duty, ready once again to move against the enemy. The patrol is still intact. Our casualties have been light. The enemy cannot say the same. As guards watch, alert for the return of the Viet Cong, enemy prisoners are processed for intelligence examination, enemy wounded are treated, enemy dead are taken care of. Then the patrol is on the move again, pressing forward toward the village, which is its objective. It's only a tiny dot on the map, but with Charlie in the area, it may be a death trap. So although the hamlet appears deserted, it's studied carefully before entry is attempted. And by radio, the patrol's plans are coordinated with higher headquarters. Men are positioned to block possible enemy escape routes from the silent, seemingly empty village. Then the patrol moves in. The village seems deserted. So while part of the patrol checks for booby traps or mines, other men enter and search the houses. They are covered from the edge of the clearing. Almost at once, a VC weapon provides evidence that Charlie has been here. But he must not have expected an attack, for no booby traps have been planted. Then the natives begin to turn up. Hiding in the houses or in caves, they are carefully searched out, gathered together and asked for their identification papers. Charlie has been here. If he's here now, he must be rooted out.
Inside, the search goes on. Every house has a hiding place, in a table, under the bed, behind the stove. All must be found and examined, especially the caves which lie beneath the houses or in the nearby woods. Everyone and everything that might lead to the VC must be turned out and checked. Only in this way can Charlie be tracked down. As the natives are gathered in, they are intensively questioned with the aid of Vietnamese interpreters. When were the VC last here? Where have they gone? How many were there? What were their plans? Did you know any of them? Are there any VC here now? Much vital information comes from these interrogations, including identification of suspected Viet Cong, who will be airlifted out for further intelligence questioning. In the nearby jungle, small bundles of VC uniforms and equipment are found. And in a tree high above the ground, a cache of rice is discovered. Left by Charlie to supply some future operation, it must be denied him. So the cache is destroyed, just as captured VC weapons, ammunition and equipment must be destroyed to strip the enemy of his ability to make war. Charlie must also be denied shelter, so Viet Cong huts are burned after positive identification as such. Great care is taken to leave the homes of friendly Vietnamese civilians unharmed, but VC dwellings are systematically destroyed. Charlie must have no place from which to operate. As the enemy is being routed out of the village, members of the patrol stand guard against the return of the Kong. Friendly natives have disclosed that the VC occupies an abandoned plantation a few kilometers distant. This is Charlie's lair, his center of operations in the area. This is where he must be met, drawn out from the shadows, and defeated. The situation is explained to higher headquarters. Next, a coordinated plan of attack is prepared and positions are taken. Then the attack begins with heavy mortar and artillery fire on the plantation from the landing zone to neutralize the enemy's installations, break up his troop concentrations and block his escape routes. firing helicopters pound the VC position, softening it for the attack. Now, only minutes away. As the bombardment continues, the patrol waits. This is a coordinated effort. Its turn will come. Then the shelling ends and in a flurry of last-minute instructions, the patrol moves out. As the men re-enter the jungle, every available helicopter is used to airlift casualties to the base camp for treatment. Prisoners and VC suspects are taken back for further questioning. The patrol moves ahead, and the old tension has returned. Charlie's up ahead, but where? Any moment he may strike. The men move on, alert, wary, tense. Plantation is reached without incident, but the moment of truth is at hand.
For an instant, nothing is heard. Only the buzz of insects, the calls of jungle birds. Then, a shot rings out. the firing ends, and the patrol moves on into the enemy's stronghold. But where is Charlie? Since the firing ceased, he's vanished. But he's not far away. Charlie has taken to the tunnels with which the VC honeycomb their positions. Now he must be rooted out, tunnel by tunnel, man by man. It's dirty, dangerous work, for the tunnel systems are full of booby traps as well as Viet Cong. But it's a job that must be done thoroughly and completely. The Cong construct tunnels and bunkers that can withstand most bombs and artillery fire. And they camouflage them well with concealed entrances and exits. In these, the guerrillas may hide for days, even weeks, lie in hiding until the time is ripe then pop out and attack our troops from the rear. That's one reason that all tunnels and fortifications must be searched and cleared. And there are other vital reasons for fine combing them. Tunnels hold stores of weapons and supplies, and they provide valuable information about the enemy and his plans. What is found and reported here is a most important source of intelligence. It must not be overlooked or ignored. For the same reason, huts and other buildings are investigated even though they appear to be destroyed. Nothing that might benefit the enemy can be left behind. VC casualties are checked for identification papers, orders, or other significant documents. And natives are queried about VC activities in the area. At the same time, prisoners are interrogated for information needed to launch further attacks against the enemy. Once disarmed, Charlie is treated humanely in hopes that word of his handling will reach his comrades and encourage them to surrender. With the VC, we'd rather have them switch than fight. Before prisoners are lifted back to the base area for more thorough questioning, they are blindfolded and tagged with the date, time, location, and circumstances of capture, together with the results of their initial questioning. Then they are moved out. When the tunnels and bunkers have been cleared, they must be destroyed, for the strike force can leave nothing of future value to the enemy. So the earth is scorched, and the enemy's hard-built hideouts rendered useless to him. The attack has succeeded. Charlie's back is broken, his headquarters destroyed, his men and supplies captured. The secrecy and speed with which the strike force moved gave the Kong no chance to disperse its men or material, to hide its capacity for waging war in the jungle. What was to have become a major staging area for VC activities in this sector has been cleared. Its arsenal of modern and effective Chinese or Russian-made weapons retired from the conflict. The captured items are sorted, classified and tagged for later study and evaluation. Even propaganda material.
What has no intelligence value is destroyed or rendered useless so that it may not serve the enemy. While this combat housekeeping is being done, headquarters is told the extent of the strike force's success, and the area is scoured for VC personnel or supplies which may have escaped the initial attack. Charlie frequently caches equipment outside his immediate staging area, and some of his men always try to escape into the surrounding countryside. So before it leaves, the strike force mops up any such remnants of a VC which have scattered throughout the vicinity, leaving no nucleus around which the Kong can form again. This is how the enemy is destroyed. This is how his lines of communication and supply are disrupted. The strike operation keeps the enemy on the defensive. That's why it is a must in counter-guerrilla warfare. The success of a strike operation is usually measured by the number of enemy buildings and fortifications cleared, by the amount of food supplies, ammunition, and weapons taken, and by the number of VC guerrillas accounted for, dead, wounded, and captured. By any of these measures, this operation has been a success. Thanks to the brave men of this small force who wage freedom's battle in this alien land, the Viet Cong have been dispersed in a tiny corner of Vietnam. Another routine strike operation is ended. Now that the strike force has completed its sweep through its assigned area, it is ready to be lifted back to its base. Guards are posted about a carefully cleared landing zone and the battle-weary troops move toward it to await the helicopters, which are already on the way. A colored smoke signal marks the LZ, and in it a tired man can see many things. Escape for a few hours or even days from the discomfort and tension of jungle warfare. Hot showers and cold beers, a good breakfast, the sound of rock and roll, it's such simple pleasures that make this tough and dirty war tolerable for the men who fight it. And fight it they do, with all their hearts and minds, for these are men not afraid to face up to their duties and obligations. They know that theirs is the cause of truth and justice, and in the end, they will prevail.